Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone, or indeed good night, if some people are on different time zones, which they are joining us uh, between Galway and Australia. Um, but welcome to everyone to today's webinar hosted by the Irish Society for Theatre Research. Uh, my name is Barry Houlihan here at the University of Galway, and this is the second in our webinar series for this year um, of 2023-24. Um, and great to have such a topic today and with such expert speakers um, on a subject that crosses most of our, or indeed all of our paths at some stage, um, about publishing in a journal. Um, so today's webinar will discuss and demystify the processes of publishing research in an academic journal and all the steps that are involved in that, preparing your work for submission, the review process, through to publication and everything in between. Um, perhaps we might even find out who Reviewer 2 really is. Um, so just in advance, my thanks to ISTR colleagues and in particular to Dr. Miriam Houghton uh, in the lead up to today uh, and indeed to our expert speakers, Professor Helena Graham and to Dr. Shona Hill. So today's session is recording and this, along with our previous webinar, ISTR webinar, will be made available on the ISTR website soon. So again, keep all questions to hand. We'll have plenty of time for discussion and Q&A at the end. Um, you can use the Q&A or, or chat box function that's on your screen. Um, and I'll keep an eye on that and, and relay everything to our speakers. So our chair for today's Q&A and discussion, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Shona Hill. Shona is an AHRC funded research fellow at Queen's University Belfast, working on a project entitled Generations and Feminist Temporalities in Contemporary Northern Irish Performance. Um, Shona's recent and, and great monogra recent monograph is entitled Women and Embodied Mythmaking in Irish Theatre. And most recently, Shona has co-edited with Dr. Lisa Fitzpatrick the book Plays by Women, 1926 to 33, Feminist Theatres of Freedom and Resistance. Um, so great to Th and thanks to hand over to you now, Shona. Perfect. Thank you, Barry. And thanks also for organising all the tech today. Um, so welcome to Professor Helena Grehan. It's really lovely to meet you, Helena, and to have the opportunity to talk with you about the uh, somewhat daunting process of getting published in a journal. Helena is Professor of Theatre, Performance and Creative Arts at Murdoch University in Australia. So while we're on our lunch hour here in Ireland, you are joining us during your evening. Uh, so we're very grateful to you for doing that. Pleasure. Helena's insights today are no doubt informed by her experiences on both sides of the publication process, as she has a very impressive publication record, as well as editorial expertise. Helena has published essays and books on spectator, spectatorship and ethics, intercultural theatre, performance and politics, and new media dramaturgy. Her publications include Mapping Cultural Identity in Contemporary Australian Performance, published in 2001, Performance, Ethics and Spectatorship in a Global Age, 2009, where people who do shows, back-to-back theatre, Performance, Visibility, Power, co-edited with Peter Eckersall in 2013. William Yang, Stories of Love and Death with Edward Shear, 2016. New Media Dramaturgy with Eckersall and Shear, 2017. And the Routledge Companion to Theatre and Politics, co-edited with Eckersall in 2019. Helena is currently Lead Chief Investigator on an Australian Research Council <coughs> linkage grant to digitise Western Australia's vulnerable cultural heritage. She's Deputy Editor of the leading performance studies journal, Performance Research. So the plan today is that Helena will talk about publishing with journals broadly, as well as the specific approach of performance research. I see that there's several uh, PhD and early career scholars who've joined us, and I'm sure that several of you have been looking at journals to see where you might place your research. As I have an article which will be published in the December issue of Performance Research, I can vouch for their very smooth process and that it's been a very positive experience. That said, I know, Helena, that you said you'll also, um, you're also planning to address how to deal with the challenges of publishing with journals, particularly peer reviews, but also rejection and having a backup plan. As Barry said, we'll ensure that there's plenty of time for questions. So if you want to put your questions into the chat as they occur to you, 
And then after we've heard from Helena, we can turn to those questions. So without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Helena. Thank you very much, Shona, and thank you, Barry, for the warm welcome. And thanks for inviting me. It's a real honor and privilege to be able to talk with you guys today. And I'm happy to be interrupted at any point if you either don't know what I'm talking about or you want uh, me to say more or less on something. So please don't worry about that. I won't, I won't mind at all. Um, I would also like to say it's really nice to hear my name pronounced properly. Uh, it's such a rare thing here. <laughs> so thank you. That's lovely. Um, I, I need to um, acknowledge that I'm speaking to you in, from Australia, from the lands of the Wajok Noongar people, and that I'm on lands that are um, owned by them and managed by them and have been for hundreds of thousands of years, and that sovereignty was never ceded and never will be. And I think it's important for me to say that, as I do every time I speak to people, in formal context, but particularly in light of the fact that we have we had a referendum here a couple of weeks ago to vote on whether to recognize um, and establish a special mechanism in parliament to deal with indigenous matters by indigenous people. And it was defeated to the devastation <clears throat> of many of us. Um, so it's a, it's a sad time in Western Australia, but it just reinforces the need to be uh, thoughtful and reflective of the fact that we are on lands that have been colonized and that there is a lot of um, structural disadvantage here at play in our community. So hang on, <clears throat> excuse me. Anyway, after that sober um, lecture, I'll get a little bit less sober, hopefully. I mean, not in the drinky sense, but in the in the humor sense and talk to you about publishing. Now, if if you want me to again, as I said, if you want me to steer in a different direction because you have never published anything or you've published millions of things and you I'm answering or posing the wrong questions, please just redirect me. It's it's perfectly uh, fine. So the first thing I would say is. It's important to do research about research. So you need to know what are the top 10 journals in your field for your specific areas of research focus? And how are they decided upon? So in Australia, we have very strange systems of metrics for measuring things in research. In and they're very science-based. And so they're probably irrelevant to what you do in Australia. So. If you're looking for a job or if you have a job and you're looking for a uh, tenure or promotion, you, there's a certain game you have to play, if you like, in terms of the kinds of publications you need to get. And I'll just give you a little story from my own experience. Many years ago when I started my first job, I the big thing was you had to have a book. You had to have a book. Everybody had to have a book. It was a book. It was a book. So I, I you know, worked really hard and I got a book. And just as the book came out, they changed the rules and said, books are not important anymore. You need a grant. And it was like, what? You know, I've just spent two years breaking my neck, working weekends to get a book because it's the most important thing. And now you're not even going to count it. So it was a very good lesson for me early in my career to remember that although you have to meet uh, imposed kind of um, ideas of what is good scholarship within your employ or when you're looking for a job, they're always changing. And so you also have to remain true to yourself and balance the desire to speak to the audience you want to speak to in whatever mode that is, whether it's a book or a journal publication or a, um, a piece for a, um, a magazine or a, you know, a more um, community-based outlet with the, um, the sort of structural uh, regulations that you are operating under or that you wish to operate under. So you need to know what they are. So <clears throat> the best way to find them out is probably to talk to your supervisor, if you have a supervisor or some senior colleagues, because they will know which journals they, they feel are the best or whether it's a book you should be aiming for or whether you should be looking to get in a team to get a grant down the track or whether you should just ignore all that and do whatever you want to do. So my advice would be don't ignore it, have it in the back of your mind, but remember that you need to speak to your audience. I have another example. 
when I was quite a young scholar, I um, I was writing about something on a, it was like a forum before, you know, before we had sophisticated internet. It was a theater forum. And I wrote something about something I was interested in. And Richard Schechner, who you probably know, is the editor of TDR, the Drama Review, which at that time we, th we thought he was God. And I was a PhD student. He emailed me and said, I really like what you're saying. Can you, would you like to submit an article to TDR? Well, I had to open a bottle of champagne. I was so excited. Um, so I wrote back to him and said, I was so excited that you emailed me that I opened a bottle of champagne, which he, I'm sure it would have stroked his ego and I was quite naive at the time. But anyway, I did submit something to TDR and I got it published. And in my discipline at the time in Australia, TDR was considered really, really amazing journal as it is still. But the Australian metrics didn't count it. So again, here I was thinking, Whoa, you know, I've got this article coming out in TDR and they're amazing. Their editorial process is really tight. If you've ever published with them, they, there's check every word. And so the quality of your work improves quite a lot from the thing that you submit and is peer reviewed into the final edited version. But here I was with my fabulous TDR publication, which was suddenly deemed to be not not really worth anything because they didn't know what TDR was. So just two cautionary tales about balancing those um, kind of contexts, the context of your discipline and the context of your desire for employment or your planning for your future for, for those promotion um, tenure type uh, steps. <clears throat> um, my One of my friends, when she started out, she had a list of the top 10 journals on her wall beside her computer. And she'd start at the top for an article and she'd send it in. And if the top one rejected her, she'd go to number two and she'd work her way down the list until she got one. And then the next article, she'd had learned something from that process. Obviously, she was bruised and battered, but she kept going until she got them in every single one of the 10. Now, that's quite a systematic way of doing it. I don't think I'm quite that sort of focused about it. Um, but it is really important to know what they are. It's also important to, when you decide what the 10 are in conversation with those people who can advise you, is to go off and read them. And yeah, I know it sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? But you actually have to know them quite well because they all have stylistic approaches and twitches or you know idiosyncrasies that are um, particular to them. So you can you get, you get the flavor of the journal once you read it and immerse yourself in some of the articles. So I would recommend, you know, sitting down at your computer and going through a series of issues or going to the library and actually taking out the paper copies and having a look at them. It's really important. Obviously, some journals are themed journals. So Performance Research, the journal I am the deputy editor of, produces eight themed issues a year all themed, no, no free space issues or open call issues. Um, other journals have a mix of open and themed or all open. So you need to think about that and be looking out for themes that you think are relevant to your area of research. So you need to get yourself on mailing lists. I'm sure you already all are because you're I'm sure you're very um, up with the world. But yeah, get on mailing lists, see what's happening. The other thing that's really important to think about is who do you really admire? Whose work do you really admire in the discipline? Not just in Ireland, but globally. And where are they publishing? So you need to be looking at that and think, where are they publishing? Because I'm reading them, so I want to be read by people like me. So look at, for those opportunities <clears throat> and um, and see what you can do by having some, some time scrolling CVs and um, yeah, looking at, at that. Um, what else was I going to say about that? Yeah. Um, let me think. You should also prepare yourself for rejection. Uh, it's a depressing thing. Um, but, and it can make you really mad. Like I, I, I get rejected sometimes and I get, I get furious and I want to break the computer for five minutes, but I go off and have a little, you know, think and come back and usually though not universally usually there's a, there's grains of truth in what they're saying sometimes they can be 
very uh, ungenerous in their wording, and that can really hurt. And I think that that we all as scholars have a responsibility to uh, frame uh, critical feedback in a positive way that doesn't totally destroy the recipient. But not everybody got that memo. So just be prepared that if they are really awful, it's sometimes not about you at all. It's about the fact that either they're stressed or rushed or they didn't read it properly or they just it's just not their thing. So don't you know. You have to not only have a little rant and stamp your feet privately, then you have to kind of step back and think about it. And then you have to sense check. Is this feedback useful for me? Is it going to enhance my article? <clears throat> or are they trying to send me down their path or a path that I'm not interested in going on? And that's a sort of thought process you have to work through. It's good to sense check it with someone else. You can talk to your supervisor or your colleagues about it. Um, everyone has rejection stories, so it it'll, might make you feel better when someone tells you a worse one than yours. <laughs> it's not that we really want to be getting getting delight in the suffering of others, but you know, it just it just reminds you that this is part of the process. I think alongside that, if you do get the opportunity to review things, you have a responsibility to be generous in your feedback, even if your feedback is not entirely positive. It helps people like us grow, and it helps us return the generosity. So just bear that in mind. We can often be very gung-ho when we're new because we're very thorough and we're very excited and we want to do a really good job, but we have to temper it with an understanding that there's a human being at the end of that um, email and, you know, you can crush someone quite easily. So I don't, I don't recommend that approach. Um, you may also be asked for major changes. <clears throat> and sometimes you'll get a review where you'll have one person loves it and one person doesn't. And the editor will then have to help you guide you through which, how much of the hater or the person who's very critical's uh, feedback you have to take on. So you normally what I would do in that situation is let's sit down, read them both, read the essay again, start working on it. It's very helpful and, so, and not all journals uh, require this, but some do, that when you write back to the editor and say, well, I've I've made the changes, um, if they don't tell you what form they want them in, sometimes it's it's helpful to send them two copies, one with the track changes and one clean. And also an explanatory email saying, you know, Professor Ace or Prof X, X said this, and I thought about that, and this is what I've done to address those concerns. Y said this, this is what I've done. Um, so you just make it easier for them because people who are editing journals are usually doing it for love and in their weekends and spare time. They're not doing it often as part of their daytime job as an academic. It's a sort of disciplinary service. Um, sometimes you'll get a review where one person says to change something and the other person says they love it and they contradict each other. So you've, that's another one that you've got to work through. Um, it's usually, you can usually do it. Uh, sometimes you have to go back to the editor if they haven't actually given you guidance on it and say, listen, um, I noticed this is some uh, conflict between A and B about what I should do. I propose to do this. Is that would that be something that you think would would respond adequately to the suggestions? So, yeah, they're human. They're usually uh, happy to write to you. They don't want to be in email co correspondence with you all day, every day because they get annoyed. Uh, maybe I'm projecting my own, you know, sense here. But sometimes someone will. The, the, um, an author will cling on to you, they, they sort of get you and they, they're delighted to have someone to talk to about their article and then they, they keep emailing you. And if you're trying to edit sometimes three issues of three different journals at the same time while you're doing your day job and you might have 10 PhD students or whatever, it's very hard to to be able to, you know, to deal with that. So just communicate with them when they give you reviews and you have a question, make their lives easy by providing them details on what you've done, but don't keep like, they're not your bestie. So just, yeah, just keep that in mind. It's not, it doesn't happen often, but sometimes it does. And also <clears throat> if you're waiting for uh, feedback on an article, it can sometimes take quite a long time. So be, be cautious about emailing to ask too often 
because that's a bit annoying too when you, again when you're, you're dealing with multiple issues uh, and multiple um journals you you just haven't got time to be tracking down where everyone is and i will admit that we're not always great at giving people a sense of the timeline i think we could be better but we don't often of, always know how long it's going to take and depends on each journal's process so um i suppose i should step back a bit and say each journal has a different process um some journals most journals um will ask for an abstract or a, a paper and then they will send it out to blind peer review for two different reviewers um, or maybe three and the reports come back in and they're the reports that you then have to reconcile and respond to major or mi minor changes some might have major some might have minor some might have major and minor <laughs> so um, and then they'll give you a turnaround time usually and you do you make those changes and as I said if if they don't give you instructions on how to submit them it's good to submit a track change copy and a clean copy so they can see what you've done makes their life easier um, and then you might not hear anything for a while. You might hear it's all fine. It's gone through, or they might come back to you with a question and then it can take an, another quite a while before you get a proof copy. <clears throat> so it, it's a slowish process. Um, and it, it draws a lot on volunteer labor. Um, with performance research, the journal that I'm the deputy editor, we have a different model. So as I've said, every issue is themed or eight issues a year and eight issues a year is really huge number of issues to be producing in a year from, from volunteer academics. So most journals won't have that. They'll have three, four, uh, one sometimes. <clears throat> um, we have a, a very different approach. So we have a team of now 12 associate editors. So we'll have an issue editor or two. So Miriam and I are the issue editors for On Invasion. Um, and they will, so someone will pitch an idea to performance research of a theme that they want to have an issue on. And sorry, <coughs> frog in my throat. And they'll pitch an issue and then the senior editor, Richard Goff and myself, and the managing editor will sit down and have a look at the, the proposal and think, mm, does that fit with our kind of journal aesthetic or remit kind of design focus themes. Yeah, yeah, it does. Okay, it does. So then one of us will provide close reading of that proposal and line by line responses about, you know, theorists that should be considered or included, artworks or performances that they might want to draw on, examples that they might want to include. And they get that feedback back and then they work that up into a call for papers which we again go through and give feedback. And once that's finalized, then that goes out to everybody on our mailing list, thousands and thousands of people. <clears throat> and they're invited to submit an abstract. So they submit an abstract and then the, the issue editors get together and they read all the abstracts and they have a meeting and they say, well, we had 300 abstracts or hundred abstracts and we think we'll probably be able to have about 18 uh, essays and a couple of artist pages. So which ones do we think are the strongest and respond best to the call for papers? Which ones do we think um, are really new, innovative and interesting or whatever it is that we're seeking? And we 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 agree which ones we're going to invite to write the full paper. <clears throat> so then we write back to them and we invite them to write the full paper. And we may actually tell them that we think in their paper they could address X, Y, and Z, or they could draw on the work of this person or that person. So we may give them uh, some extra instructions in terms of the development of their essay or artist pages. So they go off and do that then, and then they're told the, when the, 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 the work is due, and then they submit the work. And then two of our 12 associate editors, who Miriam and I, as the issue editors, don't know which two it is, and they don't know Miriam and I are the issue editors, read the whole thing. So the two of them peer review the whole issue, every single essay. So it's a big job for them. And they write a report on each one. So that's the, that's the blind peer review. And then they send those back to us and we check them to make sure they're okay. And in, in line with what our reading of the 
of the essay was or the artist pages and then we send it back to the uh, author and ask them to carry out the necessary changes um yeah so we we often give them quite detailed feedback at that point and then they've got to rework it in response to that and then they send it back again and then we read it to check that it makes sense <laughs> and that the changes haven't actually messed everything up that they've enhanced the the work rather than taken away from it and then it goes out for proofing and then we get to the stage of checking proofs and then we get to publication so our practice is very different um and my job as the deputy editor is to manage the 12 associate editors and i don't mean manage as in control or dominate but field any questions they have uh help them if there's a any clash occasionally they'll they'll be offended by something or someone will write something that's in an essay that they consider to be you know problematic from uh, equity and diversity or race gender whatever perspective so it'll come to me to mediate figure out what's going on and try and find a way through also if any of them get sick in the in the way in the middle of doing their work then if unless obviously unless I'm the issue editor I will then step in and do all of that work just so we don't slow down the process <clears throat> um they're incredibly good very thorough young scholars mostly from all over the world so it's a really good diverse group and I think we work really well together I have never seen this model in any other journal though but that's how we do it so um, it's a pleasure to work with them and I've learned an awful lot from working with them so I'm really enjoying that um do at this point does anybody have any questions because I feel like I'm kind of prattling on here and uh it might be beneficial to interject <clears throat> and don't be shy you can ask me anything I I actually have a question yeah. so Oh, sorry, Miriam. But um, what I've noticed is um, um, it's it's a little bit strange. Like when I submit my abstracts or paper, or whatever for like conferences, they tend to get picked up very quickly. Mm -hmm. Real a lot of success. But then when I send the same abstract and maybe uh, you know focus it just a little bit different for like a publication or something, it doesn't get picked. Or they they say or they it's it's not what they're looking for. It's not specific enough for, I'm not quite sure. So I'm just wondering, what is it that I'm missing? Do, do you see what I mean? Is there something specifically yeah. that you're looking for that I'm, I'm just not getting? I think it's hard to answer the question without seeing the abstracts that you're submitting. But I would say that an abstract for a conference tends to be a bit more chatty or a bit less structured and formal than a than an abstract for a, a journal article. So it, um, an abstract for a conference might not have millions of references. Uh, mind you, neither would an abstract for a journal article, but it would have so, it would situate itself in the field more uh, concisely or in a more detailed way, I think. Um, yeah, I, I think it's really important to make sure that you're you're clear about what this piece is going to do and for whom and i think you have to start there with the title this is something i just want to raise it's kind of an aside but it's it's you've reminded me titles are really important of of articles and particularly because you want your work to be read by the people as i said that you want to speak to but if they if the title is you know fanny ann's performance in you know wb yates's blah blah or whatever i'm making this up obviously you're not you're going to get three people to read it who are interested in fanny ann and wb yates you're not going to appeal so you need to make the title uh, something that has some key words from your particular focus in the discipline area that people will pick up on so something like it for me it would be spectatorship or politics or um first nations or whatever it is that i'm trying to get the attention of readers about and you need to make sure that it will appeal to people from an international readership so that you don't end up just kind of creating a small circle of people who are reading your work and not 
and that way not challenging you to progress. But if you want to send me an abstract, I'd be happy to look at it and give it back to you and from uh, with my two cents worth, which is my two cents worth. Obviously, your supervisor or your senior colleagues are more much more um, appropriate or better judges than I would be, but I'd be happy to. Miriam, you were going to say something. Yeah, hi. Hi. Um, <laughs> after all the emails, no. <laughs> um, I actually have a question about how the publications are measured in Australian universities or your university, because we've started to do <laughs> these assessments over here. I'm in the Galway University. And like you said at the start, they change the rules all the time. So yeah. they did the first kind of assessment of us. It was around 2015. And I think it was based on work in the previous three years or five years. And now we're getting assessed again, but it's based on work over a seven year spread, which is much better. But I haven't I haven't read up all the rules. But last time, you know, a monograph might be double weighted, might, but it might also be considered one output and you need three. Whereas then yeah. a journal article is considered one output. Yeah. So, you know, it would put you off doing monographs altogether. That's and that's exactly it. There was also the question of co-authorship. So I would I would say a lot of my best work is co-authored. But then unless you can prove this was in the rules the last time, I haven't checked this time, unless you could <laughs> prove 20,000 words was yours alone, it wouldn't be considered. It wouldn't it wouldn't constitute an output. But sure, if you're co-authoring a, a book chapter or a journal article, you know, it's it's 8000 words in total, maybe like so. Yeah. But in theatre as well, like it's such a collaborative ethos yeah. because a lot of us have trained in theatre or it's very interdisciplinary. Like I've done a lot of work with historians and things. So, you know, it, it it's not in the best interests of my research to not co-author. But then I'm quite cautious that I could be in trouble down the line and yeah. be mean to not, not hitting my target. So I'm wondering how does that work in where you are just because Ireland tends just to copy bigger Anglophone countries so if it could find a better uh, model to point them to <laughs> yeah no not ours uh, I think so there's different levels of of measurement so there's obviously the internal measurement that mm -hmm. the university uses each university has their own unique bespoke ridiculous set of mm -hmm. rules and then there's the sort of uh, governmental regulations about what what they'll fund mm. with the research funding to universities so about three years ago the government decided it was no longer for funding universities for the production of publications at all so all the research training fund that goes to universities now from the government on which we all reply re rely <clears throat> only funds phd completions and grant income so that changed the value of publications radically and in fact had a massive impact on humanities and yeah. social science areas because they didn't get grants most they used to be in the grant getting business very much and suddenly they had to shift their model mm. you know radically to start a make themselves competitive for these grants where the success rate is about 10 percent nationally you know and reconsider the how they communicated with their audience so that goes to the first points I was making about me and the you know producing the book and then the book was no, no good and then TDR and then TDR was no good and it's like you can drive yourself mad worrying about it I think uh, and I think you have to as you say keep it in the back of your mind that it might come back to bite you but you have to also balance that with the fact that if you get an essay in something like TDR or whatever it is whatever's your equivalent you're actually getting known by your discipline you're getting engagement from your peers and that's an incredible value for you way beyond the scope of your own institution you know mm -hmm. it's about future possibilities for collaboration it's about travel it's about invitations it's about promotion and it's about giving back to your discipline which is a really important thing to do but yes we in our university we went from a system four years ago where nobody in the university could get any research time any research time unless they could connect their research to the themes of food health or the environment now 
if you're a theater historian or if you're a contemporary performance maker, you're screwed in, under that model. So half the university got no research time and they effectively were moved from teaching and research professionals to teaching only by virtue of the model. <clears throat> caused war, caused fights, caused drama, uh, caused lots of screaming, lasted mm. 18 months. And then there was a sort of like a truth and reconciliation commission, seriously, where the leaders who had done this had to stand up in front of the university and they were shamed, basically. It was a hideous thing. I didn't go to because I thought I'm not, not participating in this business. And now we've swept, flipped dramatically the other way. So we have no uh, real sense of what is uh, needed to be produced. You have a conversation with your line manager and and she, she, you'll, be, you'll be mine, Miriam, and you'll say, Helena, what would you like to do this year? And I'll say, oh, well, I'd like to get a grant and produce a book. And, and you'd say, well, how much time do you think you need? And I'd say, oh, 70% research time. I wouldn't, but you know, some people do try it on. And then they'd say, Miriam would say, ah, no, I think you can have 30. Right, so you're all right, off you go. So there's that kind of institutional flip-floppy system that changes depending on the management. And then there's the national uh, research evaluation exercise like the REF in England, uh, which we have had for years uh, called the Excellence in Research Australia Framework, where every single, it was a massive, very expensive undertaking where every single university's outputs were ranked again, like the REF, um, and there was a national panel to assess all of the creative outputs from the country, which required, I was on that panel, it took a week in a room in Melbourne with about 35 senior academics going through each university's selected outputs to rank them. It was, it took about 600 hours of work to do that evaluation for each one of us right over the year and then they've just scrapped it mm. so now they're looking for a new model and we don't know what that'll be so i'm sorry that's a long answer but the point is yeah you just that. you have to keep them in the back of your mind the other thing about collaboration is we in australia now collaboration is key and it has to be international collaboration especially if it's with america because that drives the rankings up of the university and it's all about the rankings but it's really a very science thing it's they don't really care about us we're kind of peripheral but yeah so if you can collaborate with someone in america well you're you're amazing um and it doesn't matter who they are <laughs> and the other thing is um if you collaborate with someone in your institution it's not worth anything it's not considered to be really valid so it's a bit stupid like that stupid ten thousand words or twenty thousand words point you made Okay, so so we're all slave to these business manager yeah. neoliberal yeah. rubbish. Yeah, to get a new business manager who comes up with a new model. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. No. Okay. Um. Someone ha had their hand up. Clara, I think you did. Yeah. Um. Thanks so much. This has been really insightful so far. But you mentioned, um, Helena, the idea of reading journals, um, that you plan to submit to, and. At somewhere down the line, I was given the advice of trying to somewhere quote from a previous journal in the article you're submitting to prove to the reader that you're engaging with that journal. Is Would that be something you recommend? Obviously, it's not always going to fit. It's a, it sounds a bit. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, OK. I think it sounds a bit it might look a bit obvious. So I think you'd have to be really careful about it. And also you can't guarantee that whoever's peer reviewing your essay has read any of the previous issues either, or that they know much about the journal. Sometimes peer, you know, I get letters from people every week saying, hello, I'm from such and such journal. We have an essay, we'd love you to peer review it. And I might not have read that journal very much or really know an awful lot about it because there's so many journals. So I wouldn't know necessarily that you're quoting from somebody who'd published in the journal before. If you think it'll help your argument, go for it. And that brings me to another really important point. And it's something that I don't think we do well. This is a big claim, so you can slap me down. But I don't think we do very well 
internationally as scholars. And that is situating ourselves very clearly in the discipline internationally and engaging with the work that has gone before us. And that doesn't mean you have to say, you know, um, Ellen Diamond wrote something 300 years ago and it was really rubbish or it was fantastic, it's the best thing that's ever written. Not that kind of engagement, but actually just positioning your research in conversation with the key theorists who have gone before. And there's two reasons, there's many reasons to do that. Two of the most important ones are that you're continuing the scholarly conversation and you're extending the research trajectory. Another one is that you're actually increasing your impact because you're drawing on their work, then they're getting a boost, minor, but they're getting a boost in terms of reads. So you're you're enhancing the discipline, the discipline's visibility in general by doing that. And it's the other reason I would say is that it's, it reflects good scholarship and good knowledge of the discipline. Now, I'm not suggesting that you go and you quote, you say this, you know, this person, this person, this person, this person, this person have all written about this, that, not that sort of thing, but actually just saying, look, you know, my approach to this topic is to consider whatever it is. Um, I, I, I'm aware that it has been engaged with, you know, previously by, some key scholars, I'm I'm trying to have a conversation with their work or I'm extending their work by taking it in this direction. So it's not as much as you would do in a PhD. It's not that kind of showing your credentials, but it is about just actually uh, helping the discipline's visibility and also cementing your position in the conversation. So I think that's an important thing. <clears throat> Someone had their hand up, I think. This, there was a two chat things i might ask um a question oh, sorry, Barry. yeah no thanks so much it's, it's all this has just been all so useful um just mentioning things changing the goalposts changing a little bit over the years in terms of what to aim for in publication so open access is this huge thing on yeah. many people's agenda and a lot of funders have prerequisites that anything you publish from a grant has to be open access so even just to get some thoughts on that even from your perspective outside of performance research and just as a an author yourself Open yeah. access is great, but it doesn't come free in a lot of cases. Some journals are free open access. Others come with a hefty price tag, which could rule out a lot of junior scholars who don't have those grants. Um, well, so and empty. senior. And senior, who yeah. Have, yeah. Who aren't allowed to um, use the grants for it. Okay. So, th so that's yeah. great. If you have any comments on that, that'd be great to know. Yeah, I think experience. it's something that I, I can't speak for Ireland, obviously, but in Australia, we're really, we're really behind in dealing with it. And we are noticing that our main funder, the Australian Research Council, is beginning to say you've got to have your material in open access and you, it's really it's almost impossible to do that for people in our disciplines because they don't they're not part of big research teams necessarily and they don't have grant income that can be expended on that kind of uh thing uh some of the libraries have have banded together in australia to fund it in some ways so that's one strategy but it is something that i keep raising with our deputy vice chancellor research to say that we need to actually have a strategy on this, how we're going to do it, how we're going to, we can't pay for everybody's articles in every journal. So we need a, a framework or a, a system to um, support that. I actually applied to my own school for $2,000 for towards a open access publication. And they said that it wasn't, they didn't consider it a strategic use of their funds. So Luckily for me, though, I have a friend in the research and innovation office, the director of research and innovation. I told him, he said, I'll give you the money. Yes. All those years of doing research service for the university have kind of paid off, you know, a backhander. But no, that was a fluke. I just happened to be talking to him and telling him this because we we're having a chat. Uh, but yeah, it's a it's a really big issue. In fact, I got an email yesterday about something, something I published and could I please pay for open access? And I said, no, I couldn't. And then they wrote back and said, oh, good news, your your library is doing it. So I said, okay, go for your life. So I think it's a really important issue. I think, I don't know who the leaders are in this, maybe America, um, but we do need to look for some models of supporting it. And we do need to think about what the, what the kind of criteria might be for different disciplines uh, to access those funds because they are, they're not going away. Shona. 
Um, Helena, can I ask you about uh, or advice, guidance about finding uh, co-editors? So say, for example, you wanted to propose a uh, pitch an idea for a special issue and you're looking for co-editors in the field, but they're people that you don't necessarily know or know personally. How, how do you suggest going about that? What are, what are the pitfalls? Well, I actually, what I did, I've been reading Miriam's work. I, don't, I didn't know Miriam from Bar Soap. I've been reading her work for quite a while and I've been really impressed by it. Don't blush. Uh, and so I thought, God, I really like her her work. She's really good. I might just write to her out of the blue and see if she'd be interested in co-editing an issue with me. Now, I had no idea whether she'd be rubbish at that job or brilliant. It turns out she was fabulous. But I, I just thought, you know, what have I got to lose? She could say, no, I'm too busy. Or she could say, who the, who the hell are you from, you know, the bottom of the world, go away. But she didn't. She was really nice. And I think she was quite pleased. I don't know. But um, and we, we did a really good job. We worked really well, and really efficiently together. So I think you have to take a risk. I think sometimes people can be a bit snooty, uh, especially senior uh, colleagues in the field. They can also be incredibly generous, like amazingly generous. Uh, so you just have to give it a go and see what happens. I think knowing their work is really important. I think like I would never have asked Miriam or anybody else to work with me unless I knew what their approach to writing was or the kinds of things, the kinds of topics that they were interested in you know, so that I could think we probably will be able to get along. I mean, the first thing Miriam and I had to do was the proposal pitch and then the call for papers. And we did that really quite seamlessly, I think. So, um, yeah, take a risk, but just know that sometimes they're a bit too big for their britches. Not always, but occasionally. Yes, we've got a question from, uh, are you... Are you Hong or are you Moon Young? Uh, it's uh, it's the setting. It's actually Moon Young and Hong's my last name, but the last okay. name so Hong Hong comes first in the Zoom. Um, but yeah. thank you so much. This is really helpful, just even in terms of hearing your experiences um, and your struggles, because I'm a newly hired lecturer, so I'm really struggling balancing kind of teaching with researching, um, especially yeah. when the university ends up kind of hoarding all the workload on newly hired lecturers so yes. yeah. I'm teaching like 100 students without any TA so I'm always bombarded by marking essays and doing all these yeah. things and um, what I've been told in terms of even tenure and things or promotion is that teaching doesn't matter basically is that you just need to publish 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 um, but I feel like like our our job is actually teaching and that's what really matters right so I know people say you should do teaching led research or research led teaching, but if you're asked to teach these general courses that has nothing to do with your <laughs> discipline. Um, sorry, this ended up being like complaining about my situation, but no, no, go fine. ahead. It's fine. Here you go. Practical um, question about how did you manage time and how did you kind of balance these different um, responsibilities and even just finding the headspace for research and yeah, any guidance, yeah. any tips would be really helpful. I, I think about this a lot because I, I, I think I'm, I probably don't work as hard as I should at my teaching. I'm, I, I do, I get good scores. I'm not saying I'm rubbish and I do a bad job, but I, <clears throat> I think at early stages, people can put far too much time into lectures and I, I to writing them and, I found that I would give, I spend days working on a lecture and I'd give it and then I'd go into the tutorial and I'd say, what did you get from the lecture? And they wouldn't have a clue, like they're just nothing. And you think, I want to poke my eye out with a stick here because, you know, I was passionate. I probably did a cartwheel. You know, I was running around. I had brilliant examples. I was really provocative. thought it was amazing. You know, well, thought it was funny anyway. And they got nothing. So I thought, okay, look, this is, this is not this is not a good investment for them or for me. So I've got to change this. So I started, um, you know, putting le slightly less intense effort into crafting them. Um, and they still gave me great feedback and they still <laughs> didn't get a lot out of the lecture. So we had to go through it all in the workshop and tutorial. So um, I think that often students nowadays 
watch the lecture on two times speed or listen to half of it or don't listen to it at all. And so you it can be quite disheartening if you've really put hours and hours into it. So I think learning to be efficient with your lecture writing is a really key thing. I think uh, being really uh, rigorous about protecting a bit of time, whether it's once a day or once a week for yourself, not having emails on, just having your headphones on or whatever it takes to block out all the other crap and doing a little bit of writing is really important. If I, so in my last job, I was the Dean of Research um, and I had full on meetings all day, pretty much every day. And then I was trying to produce journal issues and write books and do grants at night and all of that. And it was a nightmare. But what I found worked for me was that when I'm writing something, you know, there's all that stuff at the beginning of writing a piece, I find where I'm sort of like a chicken that's about to lay an egg. I'm kind of approaching the desk and I'm moving away. And, and this co goes on for a few hours. I'm making a cup of tea and I'm hanging out watching and I'm back again. I'm sitting down to write two sentences. I'm up again. It's ridiculous. But anyway, it's part of the sort of, I think you're thinking about it, but you, you're not ready yet to just commit. I think when you sit down and commit and you write something, the way I do it is, so whatever the, the um, topic is uh, representations of extreme weather in Australian performance, right? That's one I had to do last week. Type, 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 read, 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 type, 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 stop. For me, having quite a few words, even if they're, I know they're in by the back of my mind, I know they're rubbish, but they're there. It's a kind of security blanket. I leave them. And then I put a note at the top of it saying to myself, this is what's rubbish, you know, this is what's not working. This is where I need to go. This is where I stopped. And this is this is the key thing that I think is the nub of all of this, just in my own words. So that if it's three days or four days before I come back to it, I don't have to kind of do all that chicken stuff all over again and start all over again and think, what was this about? Where am I? I have that reminder there so I can cut to the chase and then get, you know, keep going with the work. So that's, it's, it might not work for you, but that's a very practical strategy that I find saves me a lot of time and helps me clarify my thoughts. And what I also find is that when I'm finishing on that first day, I usually think, oh, that's all rubbish. I sometimes even write rubbish, rubbish, rubbish at the end of it. But then when I come back to it, I actually find it's not, it's not half as bad as I thought it was. So it's salvageable, you know, we can work with this. So um, I think that's a, a good strategy. I think for some people, it's good to have, you know, a calendar, a schedule of, of time. Uh, for me, I, in my, I'm not, I'm not in meetings all the time now, so I have a lot more time, but I always have, you know, for the next six weeks or so, whatever it is, days blocked out or half days where I'm working on this thing or this thing or this thing, so that I know it, that just makes me a bit calmer about the deadlines. So I know that that's, it's going to be dealt with. I don't have to do it now. I don't have to panic about it now, but I know on Monday I'm doing it between nine and 12 or whatever it is. So those kinds of things. Um, it's sometimes helpful to engage in a, with, in a peer conversation with some other people and share work if if they can be generous and fair uh, and, and swap things, even if they really are drafty, just so that you have a deadline and you have someone else to read it. That can be a really good thing to do and I think the way to develop those relationships if you don't already have them is to make sure that you go to conferences and make sure that when you do go to conferences you um you join a, any early career research or post-grad organizations or sections or sessions whatever they have and that you get to know people and that you make it you make a little posse for yourself um of people who can can be engaged with you so I think that's a really important strategy. And I meant to say conferences are really important to go to and to talk to everyone at. I think they're it's really valuable. It, they're your people. They're all, you know, they're all different. Someone is doing Shakespeare, someone is doing dance, someone is doing, you know, um Bouteau or whatever, but they're your people. So it's really important to get to know them and to be able to contribute to what they're doing and let them contribute to what you're doing. Yeah. So I hope that's helpful. Yeah, thank you so much. That's really helpful. And I Sorry. have to say, ISDR is also a great community <laughs> for, such, yeah. for such things. Yeah. yeah, of course. Mm -hmm.
Uh, anybody else? Come on down, the price is right. I'm conscious of the time there, Helena, because I know some people might need to, um, on the hour, get back to... Uh, oh, okay, sorry, yeah, sure, sorry. Anything else? Are there any burning questions? I'll just say one it's, more thing, sorry. Uh, as, sure a kind of, as a kind of um, entree into journals, <clears throat> it's sometimes useful to offer to do a book review. But don't get into the trap of doing millions of them because they're, they're never counted in anybody's metrics for anything. They're a good disciplinary service thing. And they're a good way of, of honing your, like getting a free book, but also honing your focus on an argument and being able to um, respond to a book in a generous way, even if you have some critical comments. Um, so I think that's a one thing to to try out, maybe, if, if you think. And book, uh, journal editors are always looking for good book review um, people. It's hard to find them sometimes because there's an awful lot of books out there to be reviewed. I think um, your all your suggestions and advice, I think what really um, comes through to me is how, how practical your advice is in terms of balancing um, being strategic, trying to work within those moving goalposts, um, but also looking after yourself as well um, so that you can continue to do the research and maintain the, the pace and the, the passion and the motivation as well. Yeah, that's um, right. So it's, I know you emphasise the importance of um, being generous and generous feedback in reviewing, but actually this has been incredibly generous of you, Helena. Um, it's really uh, valuable practical advice um so on behalf of, of of everyone and i know more people couldn't come today and i'll be watching watching this back and um, so, but behalf on everyone thank you so much um for sharing your your wisdom and your expertise with us helena